Let us pray. Glorious God, when Jesus was baptized for your healing mission, the heavens opened in a flash of glory as vision and voice blazed upon the waters. May your spirit so burn in us that we hear your word translated into deed and follow. Jesus in paths of justice, right relationship, and peace. Listen for the word of God in Isaiah 43. But now, says the Lord, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel, don't fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be scorched, and flame won't burn you. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Because you are precious in my eyes, you are honored, and I love you. I give people in your place and nations in exchange for your life. Don't fear, I am with you. From the east, I'll bring your children. From the west, I'll gather you. I'll say to the north, give them back. And to the south, don't detain them. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Listen for the word of God in Acts chapter 8. When word reached the apostles in Jerusalem that Samaria had accepted God's word, they commissioned Peter and John to go to Samaria. Peter and John went down to Samaria where they prayed that the new believers would receive the Holy Spirit. Thus was because the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Here ends the epistle lesson. Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 3. Glory to you, O Christ. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you... I am well pleased. This is the good news. Praise to you, Christ. Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. You may have noticed that the first two readings were in the Common English Bible, but the third translation was New Revised Standard. That's because in the Common English Bible it said, You are my son, the beloved, in whom I find happiness. And I just could not, I just couldn't, couldn't say that. I'm sorry. It just sounds a little too something. Probably a better translation into our local vernacular, but I just wasn't able to go there. I apologize. But as we talk today about baptism, 
The questions that we find ourselves confronting are, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a part of the community of God, the church? And how, in all of this, do we know what God has done for us? Because a lot of that, a lot of these concepts that we talk about in church are big and heady. We use fancy words like justification and sanctification and propitiation and uh, reconciliation. We use a lot of words that are of Latin origin, and they can be a little confusing even to those of us who, um, who should know technically what they all mean. So how do we make sense of that? What is it we can grasp in our everyday lives? We know that our uh, faith is grounded in the person of Jesus Christ. We know that his birth, his life, his teaching, his death and resurrection serves collectively as the anchor for our faith. But again, that was 2,000 years ago, and it's a little hard to kind of figure out, well, how do we make that faith our own here and now. Jesus is our inspiration. Jesus is our model for imitation. And Jesus is the one who shows us what God is like. And through Jesus, God has affected our salvation. But again, these are very heady concepts. These words sound nice, but they don't translate well into our everyday lives. And I was just thinking about that as I was doing the children's message, realizing when you give a children's message, that's when you really have to think about the words that you say and whether or not they're making sense to your audience. That doesn't mean that I always pick good words, but nevertheless, I'm thinking about the bad words that I've just used that were not really appropriate for their age level. But I digress. These words that we use are so beautiful that they're heavy, they're long, and they don't necessarily translate well into our everyday life. So how can we know that God is really with us? How do we know that God is standing in line with us? Well, of course, we're Reformed Christians, so what do I do? I turn to the Heidelberg Catechism, of course. And what does the Heidelberg Catechism tell us? It tells us that sacraments are holy signs and seals for us to see. They were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and might put on, put his seal on that promise. Now, that's a lot of words, right? Shorter words, but still a lot of words. So we're talking about sacraments as holy signs and seals. They're something that we can see, touch, feel, smell. They were instituted by God so that by using them, we might understand more clearly the promise of the gospel. And their seals put on God's promise. So since we're talking about baptism today, that's what I was going to talk about, these sacraments, and how they provide this bridge between the big ideas and our everyday lives. You know, Douglas John Hall, who's a theologian that has been very influential to my own theology, talks about how, you know, we talk about this scandal of particularity, which is this fancy way of saying, why did God come in a specific place and a specific time? We can handle these sort of generic universal concepts, but why does God come in a very specific and culturally bound way? And the reason why is because we humans need those particular specific examples in order to understand those universals. How is it we learn about love? Do we learn about it in an abstract philosophy class? No. We learn it usually first from our parents, and then from friends and other family members. How do we learn about justice? Do we learn about justice from reading about it in a book? Well, ultimately, sure. But initially, we learn about it from the lived experience, from real life experiences. And so see, sacraments function that way. They are real physical things that we can hold on to when we're talking about concepts that are really very big and sometimes hard to even visualize. You know, baptism unites us to the triune God through the work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And communion renews us, it connects us to the triune God and to the whole people of God in all times and in all places. And today we are going to focus on baptism. You know, today we read the story of Jesus' baptism. 
and we reflect on what baptism means for us today. And we also renew our baptismal vows. Now, when we talk about baptism, many of you had to go through a confirmation class or something like that, and so you had to learn about baptism once upon a time. And I could go into a very heady discussion about baptism, the Eucharist, and ministry, which was this ecumenical document back in 1982. Suffice it to say, I will just focus on a few items here, because I don't want to get heady. What I find most significant about the meaning of baptism, you know, we could talk about the participation in Christ's death and resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit, or incorporation into the body of Christ. We could say those things, but what do those words really mean? What I find most significant here is that in the sacraments, we see how Jesus, God in Jesus, joins with us. The Son of God deigned to join with us lowly creatures. Notice in the Gospel of, jo of Luke how the writer talks about baptism. Did you, did you notice as you were reading and thinking, wait, there's some pieces missing, or there's certain things you didn't quite remember? Well, probably mostly things were missing, because you may have noticed Jesus' baptism was like a half a verse in the Gospel of Luke, which is quite a far cry from what it is in Matthew. Matthew has this whole conversation between Jesus and John, where John says, baptize you, and Jesus says, you must, and John's like, I can't, and Jesus says, you must, and eventually John does. There's nothing like that in the Gospel of Luke. There is no dialogue with John whatsoever. In fact, it's mentioned in a way that almost makes it sound like an afterthought. Notice that in the baptism story that Jesus doesn't even get individual treatment. The text merely tells us pull it up and I'll read it specifically again to reiterate. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, that's how it describes it. Almost like an afterthought. No individual treatment whatsoever. And one of the commentaries that I was reading used this beautiful analogy that I, I'm going to use today. Jesus was standing in line. We've all had that experience of standing in line. A number of us have probably been to Disneyland and to the great amusement parks. And I remember, you know, a few decades ago now, I guess it actually been, where there was a special pass that you could buy, that when you had that pass, you didn't have to stand in line when you went to the amusement park. And so if you paid extra, you could actually get into these rides ahead of everybody. Well, Jesus, as the Son of God, he has the ultimate pass, doesn't he? He doesn't need to stand in line, and yet he does. He stands in line with the crowd, and he waits his turn to be baptized. That is a powerful image for us, because this is a God that comes to us in complete and utter solidarity with the human condition. This is a God who immerses himself in what it means to be a human being. This is not a God who lives in a high and mighty castle somewhere way above us. This is a God that gets down into the earth and joins with us and gets his hands dirty. It is the mark of true love, joining with others in true solidarity. And notice that Jesus prays in this version of the baptism story. Luke's Gospel is the only one that mentions Jesus praying at his baptism. Again, Jesus is standing in line with us, praying just like we pray. And what happens when he prays? Notice it's when he prays that this happens. That is when the dove descends on him. In the other Gospels, it is the act of baptism that initiates the coming of the Spirit. But here it's actually connected to his praying, which is really interesting. Because here we can see that there is a clear connection between baptism and prayer and the coming of the Holy Spirit. So that reminds us, the people of God today, that although our church is grounded in the sacrament of baptism, it is sustained 
by prayer. It is through prayer that we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives. And then the Holy Spirit is able to guide us and renew us. Now that's not to say that every time we pray, the Holy Spirit is going to fall on us in such a dramatic fashion. And that's also not to say that God won't deign to fall on us anyway, whether we choose to pray or not. There's a reason why we talk about the hounds of heaven getting us, whether we accept it or not sometimes. God's grace grabs us and pulls us in anyway. That happens too. God always has sovereign freedom. But we recognize that although the church is grounded in baptism, it is sustained by prayer. And we also see how the church is an alternative community. It's a group of people joined together by God's work. Notice it's not by human action here. We don't do anything to deserve to be part of the church, nor do we do anything to deserve to continue to participate. And the church is drawn from all races, from all classes, from all languages, cultures, genders, and yes, even sexual orientations. The church is what unites us into God's love and our love for one another. So not only, not just is the church a community where God is standing in line with us, but each of us is called to stand in line for each other. And also, baptism reminds us that the Christian life is not an individualistic activity here. Some folks, and you probably know some of these folks, will talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My personal favorite was with one of my professors in seminary who pastored a German Reformed church. And one of his parishioners, she was getting kind of trying to be converted by the chaplain at the nursing home. And so he went to talk to her and say how she was doing. And she's like, well, I don't know. This chaplain asked me about when I was born again. So I asked him if he knew his catechism, and that first stumped him. <laughs> but the reason why I mention this is because it's not just about me and Jesus and my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is all well and good, but that's not all there is to the walk of faith. And so often when we talk so much about our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I think we lose sight about the fact that we are blessed by God in order to be a blessing to others. And that's the beauty of baptism, because it reminds us that being with Jesus Christ means being with Jesus Christ's people. It means being a part of his body, the church. Baptism doesn't just symbolize the washing away of our sins. It also initiates us into the covenant of grace which entails being part of a community. And for Christians, we know that God's grace is mediated to us through this covenant, through word, which is the scripture preached, and through baptism and the Lord's Supper. And those are only available in the context of a community. You can't have those on your own by yourself. And we also read about how Jesus Christ in, in Jesus Christ, God joins us. God becomes human. God shares our common lot. And God enjoys and suffers all that comes with being human. And God does it just out of pure love. So yes, these are some very heady themes. The meaning of baptism can be very sophisticated, and many books have been written on the subject. But the key piece here is that God is coming to us and sharing our humanity through the person of Jesus Christ. And the sacraments are these little reminders that we have in our daily lives. Every time we see a loaf of bread or eat bread, we can be thinking about the Lord's Supper. Every time we wash our hands with water, we can be thinking about, oh, the water's so Every time we're at the pub having some wine, we can be thinking about oh, the sacrament, communion. These are those little reminders to us all the time. Martin Luther was, uh, was reputed that whenever he had these serious doubts 
of his faith, of what he was doing, and if he was really on the right track. And when he had those moments, he would say, I've been baptized. I've been baptized. You see, in all of this, that is something we can hold on to. Because some people will say, oh, well, I believe, and that's what saves me, it's my belief. And it's like, well, but do you believe all the time, or do you ever have doubts? Uh, probably. But you know that you've been baptized. You have that moment of grace that entered into your life, and you can hold on to that no matter what your doubts are. So the sacraments bring us back to the tangible. Water splashed. It's great on little kids. Bread broken and wine poured. These physical actions represent to us what it is the life of faith is all about. What God has done and what God continues to do for us, plural, through Jesus Christ.